<laughs> Let us begin. Um, thank you, thank all of you for coming to the second meeting of the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club. And we are um, devoting four months, four sessions to reading Bleak House. And this is the second of those four meetings. And the reading assignment for today was to read through chapter 32 of the novel. And my, uh, my rule of thumb, uh, my, my, uh, my requirement for purposes of our discussions is that we should not discuss anything that takes place beyond chapter 32. Now, I know that many of you have already read the novel, read beyond chapter 22, may have read the novel many times, and so you know things that are going to happen later on. But let us, insofar as we can, limit our discussion to uh, events and chapters that lead up to and go through chapter 32. And that is exactly halfway through the novel. And one of the things that is characteristic about Dickens's organization of his novels um, from Dombey and Son on, and, and this is Bleak House is no exception to this, is that he thought of the, uh, the, the, the novels that were written in monthly serial parts as divided into four sections. Um, so uh, the first quarter, the first five monthly numbers constitute a, a unit of narration. The second five chapters uh, constitute another uh, segment of the narration. And the 10th monthly number uh, is a kind of uh, climax in the middle of the novel. So things that happen in monthly number 10 of the 20 serial parts uh, novels you know, published in 19 parts because the last number is a, a double number. But monthly number 10 is always a climactic point in the novel. And I'm sure that in your reading of the novel and your rereading of it, that you will have noticed that there are two climactic events that occur in monthly number 10. Um, one is the famous spontaneous combustion of Mr. Crook, and the other is um, Esther's illness. El Esther contracts an illness and um, at the end of uh, chapter 31, she announces that she is blind. She has gone into um, what we now think of as social distancing. That is, she has retreated to her bedroom because she has contracted the illness. It's one of the ways in which Bleak House is particularly relevant to our pandemic time is that it too deals with, uh, with a plague. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting that the name of the disease that Esther contracts, um, and we need to talk about how she contracts that disease. Uh, the name of the disease is never specified. It is called simply the fever, the fever. And uh, it's generally, in, in the critical literature about Bleak House, it's generally thought that the illness she contracts is smallpox. But there were frequent cholera uh, outbreaks during the 1840s. And Dickens was very much concerned with issues of public health and sanitation. And uh, um, anyway, I, I, I think we, it's, it, it's useful to preserve some ambiguity about the nature of the disease that she contracts. So um, those are the climactic, the two climactic events that occur in monthly number 10. And I think it's, it's uh, important and, and useful for us to ask the question. Um, it's the, the question that I, I began with uh, in our first meeting um, last month. Uh, what connection 
can there be? And um, what connection can there be between Joe the crossing sweeper and the mercury and powder? Um, what connection can there be between distant events and distant people? So for monthly number 10, I think it's useful to ask the question, what connection can there be between these two climactic events of Crook's spontaneous combustion and Esther's um, illness? Um, and I, I don't want to uh, foreclose that discussion. I'm, I, I have some thoughts about it myself, but I'd be interested to know what, what you think as, as well. Um, so what connection can there be is a, a general question, I think, that uh, we need to ask about uh, Bleak House as a novel, ask about it in terms of its plot, ask in terms of its narration, uh, ask in terms of its language as well. Um, the connections that hold this novel together are, are manifold. Um, and I think one of the pleasures of rereading this novel is to go back and discover the many threads of connection that exist from the very beginning of the novel. Um, if, we, if we go back and look at that very that wonderful first paragraph of, uh, of the novel uh, in Chancery, the description of the implacable November weather, uh, 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 dogs indistinguishable in mire, that's my dog who was out in the rain today, horses scarcely better splashed to their very blinkers, foot passengers jostling one another's umbrellas, mind blew out inside out today, in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if the day ever broke, adding new deposits to, to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating a compound interest. The general infection of goodwill mentioned in that first paragraph is one of the threads of connection that leads us back to uh, the climactic event in chapter 31 when, uh, when Esther falls ill. But that, that illness, that illness has been present and looming upon us um, in many ways, both literally and figuratively. So if we ask again the question, what connection can there be? One of the answers to that is the, the, the figure of the fog. Uh, the famous fog description, which is uh, uh, prominent in, in the very chap first chapter of the novel. And fog is something that Esther discovers when she first comes to London. So fog appears uh, in the uh, omniscient narrator's part of the novel, and it occurs also in Esther's part of the novel. So fog, both as a literal substance and as a metaphor is one of the things I think we could say that's a dominant motif in the novel and one of the things that connects the different narratives. But fog is also important in relation to uh, Esther's illness because when we push on the, the matter of fog a little bit further, one of the things that we need to recognize is that uh, in the Victorian period, before the uh, uh, germ theory of disease, uh, one of the very prevalent beliefs was that illness was spread through the air. So the fog that encompasses London and that spreads out to Chesney Wold as well um, is air that is contaminated, contaminated by the uh, burning of coal in London, uh, by factories in the rest of England, in the north of, of England. Um, and the, the word that we, you know, the disease of malaria literally means bad air. 
So uh, the fog is both uh, a, a form of corruption. It's a way in which disease is spread. And there are many other ways in which the patterns of language, the patterns of weather, the patterns of, uh, of, uh, of narration in the novel hold this book together. There are details that appear early, early on. Uh, the little mad woman who turns out to be Miss Flight, the man from Shropshire who turns out to be Gridley. Um, these are mentioned early in the novel and they often don't manifest themselves as uh, important details or as salient details until much later. Um, one of the things that I wanna spend a little bit of time on today and ask you to participate in, in discussing is the minor characters in the novel. Um, I, uh, one of the marvels of this novel is the sheer number of characters who appear in it. And the characters are not all present at the beginning, they're doled out uh, slowly over the course of many months. And um, at, at one point, uh, I, I don't have the exact figures now, I, I kept track of uh, which new character was introduced in each chapter of the novel. And it goes up for uh, uh, 20 something uh, chapters. There's a, there's a new character who's, who's, who's introduced. And for example, um, the Iron Master chapter, which is chapter 29, that's nine months into the novel. If you're reading this in serial parts, um, you're, you're trying to keep track of all the details of plot and all the small characters, the minor characters, and suddenly here is a chapter that is entitled The Iron Master and that introduces a fairly significant character uh, who comes to Sir Lester Dedlock and uh, uh, has a proposal to make to him. Um, and in that same chapter, we meet another minor character who is one of my favorites in the novel, Volumnia Dedlock. Uh, so this extraordinary um, uh, strategy that Dickens uses of introducing new characters in, uh, in each of uh, the chapters for it, it, almost the, entirely uh, the, the first half of the novel uh, is another, I think, one of the, um, the marvels of this book. Now, what connection can there be in this novel where new characters keep entering the story and, and plot lines begin to uh, uh, coalesce, but uh, ramify at the same time to spread out in different in different directions. Um, one of the things that this novel is famous for is that it is one of the very first detective novels. It uh, one of the um, uh, minor characters who turns out to be quite important is Inspector Bucket. And Bleak House is sometimes called the first detective novel. Um, I, I don't think that's literally accurate. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe had written detective stories before that, but, um, um, but it, it may be the first English uh, uh, detective novel. But it's more than, than just a, a detective novel. It's a novel with, with many detectives. And, and uh, the theme of detection is one of the important themes and motifs in, uh, in the novel. And I think it's useful to stop and meditate for just a minute on who the detectives in this novel are. Um, we have Inspector Bucket and Inspector Bucket is uh, moving uh, 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 forward uh, uh, in, in the service of, uh, of uh, Mr. Talkinghorn. Um, uh, and uh, um, I, I see we have a, a hand up, so I'll, I'll ask Kevin to uh, 
uh, participate in the discussion of, of detection. Yes, Kevin, unmute yourself and speak. Hi, John, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, we let me, uh, I'm not going to bother with the video because I'm on my phone, but uh, one of the detectives is Guppy. And uh, at the end of chapter 29, uh, Guppy reveals to Lady Deadlock that he's pieced together that that Hawden was es Esther's real uh, father's name. So, yeah. so then, and, and that's a revelation scene. Uh, so then uh, we find out that, uh, you know, Lady Deadlock was, uh, is and was Esther's mother at, at yes. that point. So, and that's revealed through, through and, and in this novel of connections, as you alluded to earlier, one, one of the fascinating things in chapter five, when you talk about going back to the early chapters and how things, you know, manifest themselves as connections, Esther has had seen Nemo's writing advertising for work in Crook's shop. And, and as first time readers, there's no way we can know that Esther is actually reading her father's handwriting, but she is. And, and at this point, you know, the good reader can go back and say, wow, what a, what a web he's weaving here from the very, very beginning. And we're only halfway through. <laughs> So very, very good. Thank you. Yes, Guppy is is one of the um, um, other detectives in the novel, and it's uh, it's it's interesting to think about what kind of detective Guppy is, um, uh, because uh, he he's he's a lucky detective, you might say, um, because Guppy stumbles across evidence. Um, he's not uh, a professional detective. He's, he's someone who, who comes upon evidence and then gradually begins to piece it together without completely understanding um, what he has, has come across. Um, and one example of that is that on, when the court is on vacation and Guppy has time to um, take some time off, he goes out into the country. And one of the things that he does is to come across Chesney Wold, the, Les Do the Deadlock uh, family home. And he requests, this is uh, something that, that happens um, commonly, I think, in the, in the 19th century. He, he asks if he might take a visit of the house. And so he takes a visit of the house and he sees a portrait of Lady Deadlock. And he says, I, I, I've seen that face somewhere before. <laughs> um, and he has just stumbled upon the remarkable facial resemblance between Esther and Lady Deadlock, which is one of the clues. But at that point, he has not realized uh, th what that connection is. Uh, it's an enormous piece of luck that he will later on be able to uh, put together in a more coherent narrative. But uh, the point I want to emphasize is that, that Guppy, although uh, he certainly is one of the detectives, is not what we might think of as a mastermind of a detective, whereas Inspector Bucket is a professional uh, uh, detective. And he is someone who has remarkable powers of observation and synthesis. So who are some of the other detectives? I'll, I'll, I'll ask people to um, contribute to this line of discussion that you would like to, to mention. So Faye, I see, yes, unmute yourself. And, and... Um, I'm thinking that Crook in his parallel chancery it, it acts as a detective. Okay, say more about that. I mean, because I think I think you're right, but but in what way is is Crook a detective? Well, he's trying to figure out what's in all those papers, even though he can't read them. He can't read them. He can't read. Them. <laughs> so if if Guppy is a is a lucky detective who stumbles across things, Crook is a different kind of detective. He's someone who accumulates everything. I mean, he runs a a, a junk shop essentially. Um, and he knows that he has papers and documents 
and that they contain something that he doesn't have access to because he's illiterate, he can't read them, but he's accumulating evidence without knowing what to do with it. Um, so uh, again, a, an incomplete detective, but someone who uh, by virtue of his uh, hoarding uh, tactics uh, is, is keeping information that it will turn out to be crucial in the story. So Crook, Crook as, a, as a detective. So Kirk, unmute yourself and, and speak. A uh, lady deadlock, it seems to me, is clearly a detective. She's being detected upon, but she's also doing detective work to find out what happened to her lover. And if I may say so, for me, chapter 29 is one of the tremendous things. I've never read this novel before, and I'm up to 32. But for me, chapter 29, as great as 32 and the rest are, <laughs> 29 is just tremendous because it shows her as a three-dimensional human being that can feel pain. Yes. And when she's crying, uh, I thought it was a tremendous chapter. But she's certainly one of the detectives. She is certainly one of the detectives. Um, and just stay on, stay on the screen for just a, a minute more. And what is the uh, other evidence that you would uh, cite to uh, show that Lady Deadlock is a detective? Well, the most amazing is in a Sherlockian way, right? She goes into disguise at the graveyard in I think it's chapter uh, 16, right? Yes. And that's a tremendous scene. I mean, I, I, I must say I'm blown away by this novel and I don't know why on earth it isn't always being talked about every day among people because it's just brilliant. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, so, so thank you. Yes, Lady Deadlock in, in, in chapter, is it chapter 19? I, I, I don't have the... Um, or, I think or it's, is it 16? It's 16. It's 16. It's 16. It's 16. It's 16. It. Goes, goes into disguise, disguises herself as a servant, and uh, finds Joe the crossing sweeper and asks Joe to take her to the graveyard um, because she's trying to find out information about uh, her, her lover. Um, uh, the, the man. And the um, uh, Kevin was, of course, uh, correct that uh, Esther early on uh, has seen a sample of handwriting from uh, her father, the man who is her father, although he does not know, she does not know that uh, that is his handwriting. She has actually, I think, seen his handwriting once earlier because uh, she received the, the letter that she receives in chapter three of the novel from Kengi and Carboy is written in a law hand. And I think that that the, the writer, the scribe for that letter is probably uh, her father as well. So anyway, very good. Lady, Lady Deadlock, we add to the list of, of detectives. Um, Nina, I'm going to take, take people in the order of the hands that they have up. So please. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to mention Mrs. Snagsby. Yes. Um, she's <laughs> maybe like not a very good one and, you know, comes up with a lot of conspiracy theories. But, you know, in terms of like trying to watch out and look out and, you know, spying on people or whatever and coming up with her conclusions. Um, I mean, she kind of, yeah, forces all these like alternative hypotheses into the in the story to kind of like throw red herrings around. Um, well, and not to you, like the reader, but, you know, maybe to the people <laughs> involved in the story. Yes, yes, yes. Ms. Mrs. Snagsby is one of one of my favorite characters in the novel. I have so many favorite characters, but um, she's an example of if we're if we're thinking of different kinds of detectives, she's the bad detective <laughs> because, as you say, she has conspiracy theories, and her principal conspiracy theory is what? Oh, that um, you know, Mr. Snagsby is is having an affair, you know, or, you know, Joe's his illegitimate son, whatever, like, you know, things like that, yeah. you know, <laughs> so she doesn't want to be taken advantage of. And yeah, she uh, <laughs> tries to like fit everything to her hypotheses. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. And she's, she's on to a, a question that is quite relevant to the novel, which is illegitimacy. I mean, her, her conspiracy theory is wrong with respect to her husband, but it's correct at a different location in the novel. So, so thank you about that. Um, yes, Melody, I'll, I'll ask you to contribute to this. This is wonderful, thank you. Well, I would say Tolkien Horn is the devious diabolical detective <laughs> who wants to know everything about everyone so that he can control them. So he's not a, he's not a good detective, he's a, an evil man. He's an evil detective. Okay. Yes. Um, if if um, can you say more? Just el elaborate a little more on Tolkien well, Horn's style well, of detective. He searches for details, and when he thinks he might know something, he goes after the person the way he does Lady Deadlock. He he goes after her and manipulates her until he finds out what he wants to find out. He's just amazingly devious and horrible. Okay. Um, his, his moral character is, is one thing. What is his style of detection? If, if a crook is, is a hoarder of evidence that he doesn't know how to interpret, and Guppy is a lucky detective who stumbles across pertinent evidence but doesn't know how to put it, it all together. And Mrs. Snagsby is a bad detective. <laughs> uh, what's the style of detection that well, characterizes? Well, he's brilliant. He's very uh, detail oriented, and he gets to the truth so that he can use it. Okay. Okay. That's um, that's his his goal. Um, Phyllis, I'll. I'll I see your hand up, so I'll, I'll ask you to contribute to this. Unmute yourself, please. <laughs> That's better. Lovely to see everyone again. I'm going to go off a little away from Tolkien Horn, though he reminds me so much of Parker in a way, mm -hmm. um, the way he uh, battens off the others to do his evil deeds. But um, I think one of the main detectives is Esther, um, because she's the one who um, as I was rereading this, I, and I stopped at Esther's narratives, and I started to say to myself, who is she writing this for? She says, I must write this down. And then she'll do these little tidbits like, well, at that point, I thought it was this, but later on, I learned it was that. So I, I feel as if um, the, the, the te narrative tension between Esther is almost like Dickens the omniscient author knows all the answers and Esther is trying to find them out from that. It's, there's a sort of a dialogue going on there um, that the reader is watching. Um, and that goes back to the act of writing and the role of writing in all of this, literally the legal writing, um, Crook's discernment of H, trying to figure out what H was. And they talk about that with uh, Guppy um, and, uh, and, and Esther's own writing that she is doing and letters that people get and send and hide and threaten people with. And uh, uh, so it's almost the story itself becomes um, a contest between um, those seeking to hide things and those seeking to find things. That's a very good observation. Um, and I, I'm going to stop and talk a little bit more about Talking Horn and then circle back to Esther as detective, if I, if I may. Talking Horns, I asked about the style of detection that um, uh, characterizes Talking Horn. And Talking Horn, I would uh, argue if if you if you're familiar with uh, sort of the later history of detective fiction, Talking Horn you could describe as an armchair detective, as opposed to Guppy. Guppy is out in the world, stumbling across evidence. Guppy moves around. Talking Horn stays in his office and thinks. He's the armchair detective. Detective. He's he's. Uh, a deductive thinker. He comes across one clue 
in uh, chapter chapter two of the novel. Uh, who wrote that, says Lady Dedlock impulsively. And Talking Horn recognizes that impulsive uh, behavior on the part of someone as composed and in control as Lady Dedlock is, uh, is unusual. It, it, needs, it needs an answer. So he's asking a question. Who wrote that is the question that Tolkien Horn wants to get an answer to. And that in turn leads him to uh, discover other things. So uh, Tolkien Horn's style of detection is intellectual. It's, it's, uh, it's deductive. It's, uh, um, it's uh, it, there, there's one scene uh, and I'm not gonna remember the, um, the, the chapter, so I can't direct it to you, but the, it's in the, the narration by the, the omniscient. And uh, Tolkien Horn is sitting at his desk and he has a red piece and a black piece, and he's moving them around on the, on the surface of his desk. He's trying to put these pieces together, but those pieces that he's moving around are not evidence their abstractions. Talking Horn is thinking about, he's trying to work this out in his mind, as opposed to Guppy, who's legs and action out in the world. Esther, as a, as a detective, um, Esther, I, I would characterize as a reluctant detective. Um, Esther wants to know things. But at the same time, she doesn't want to know things um, because she's afraid of what she might find out. And um, Esther asks a question. One of the things that, that generates a detective story is a question, you know, who wrote that uh, is uh, Lady Dedlock's question. Uh, Esther's question is, did mama die on my birthday? Um, and she, her question is, who are her parents? And, but she knows that she has no parents and to find out that she has parents might be very upsetting to the parents, might be upsetting to her. And for example, um, she uh, uh, she's taken uh, care of by a guardian, Mr. Jarndyce. And Mr. Jarndyce, um, uh, what are Mr. Jarndyce's motives? What does Esther think Mr. Jarndyce's motives are? Why is this man interfering in her life, taking care of it? It certainly is a nice thing, but she wonders if Mr. Jarndyce is her father. Um, but she doesn't want to ask him uh, directly because it, if Mr. Jarndyce is her father, he will tell her. But if he doesn't want to acknowledge that he is her father, then she, out of courtesy or out of affection or out of some sense of propriety, doesn't want to ask him that question directly. So one of the things that is, I think, indicative of her reluctance um, as a detective is uh, the scenes that take place in the growlery. And the growlery is a very odd place in Mr. Jarndyce's uh, house, in Bleak House. It's a place where he goes when the wind is in the east and he growls and it's kind of comic you know we uh, wouldn't it be nice if we all had a had a room we could go to and growl and get our bad spirits out of the way and then resume the rest of our lives so it's kind of cute it's an architectural oddity but there's a chapter fairly early in the novel after esther has gone to to bleak house um, where she wakes up in the middle of the night and goes to the growlery 
and discovers Mr. Jarndyce in the gallery. And they have a very interesting conversation in which um, neither one of them speaks openly, honestly, directly to the other. It's they're, they're sort of working their way around a subject, a subject that they don't want to talk about. And Esther's question lingers over that whole discussion. Who is Mr. Jarndyce to her? Is he possibly her father? So I think that characterizes Esther's role as a detective in the novel, that she wants to know, but at the same time doesn't want to know the answer to the questions that she has. And part of the reason that she doesn't want to know the answers to the questions that she has is that those questions may be destructive, that they may be, uh, the answers to those questions may be destructive, may be destructive to her, may be destructive to other people. And so Esther's reticence, Esther's, again, if we think of, of the style of detectives in, in the novel, Esther's style is um, characterized by uh, self-deprecation. She says she's not very clever, but she is clever. We, we know that she's clever. So her, her pose as not very clever is part of her low self-esteem, we could say. Um, it's, it's also, I think, um, a, a kind of ambivalence about certain kinds of knowledge. Um, so uh, let me stop at this point and uh, call on a few other people. Carolyn, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you. Unmute. Okay. I had the thumbs up. I thought it was a hand. I couldn't see so clearly. <laughs> I just want to preface it. I adore mysteries. Read them all the time, John. So <laughs> your discussion of different kinds of Detectives is, is just very wonderful. Um, I think Madame Hortense is a detective. I mean, she's just very, she, and I think she represents the Victorian idea of what a servant is. They're like a piece of the wall. They don't hear anything, they don't think. And in her way, I kind of, I feel sorry for her because she's had to really find her way in difficult circumstances. So she's very clever. And the way she's examining what, uh, Lady Dedlock's um, mystery might be, and and so I think she's very good detective. Very okay. Good. Okay. Um, with with Hortense, one of the things we need to do is to um, ask, and this is true of of all of the detectives, I suppose, is uh, motivation. What is what's the motive uh, for Hortense's um, investigations? And um, um, they have to do, I think, with social class. So you're right to talk about Hortense as servant. Self-preservation, um, I think. Well, self-preservation, but more than self-preservation. I mean, what does she want to do? What does, what does she, if she's looking for information, what does she want to do with the information? We could ask that question of the others as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if Esther doesn't want certain kinds of information, why doesn't she want them? What does Tolkienhorn want to do with the information that he gets? Um, Tolkienhorn, we know from early on in, in the novel, is a collector of secrets. He's the collector of, he's the guardian of the, uh, the, uh, the secrets of the, the Deadlock family. So he collects secrets. Yeah. Um, almost for their own sake, but mm. then, then to see what he can do with them. Um, so he develops a motive later on without, uh, you know, he wants to possess a secret and then see where it, will, where it will, will lead. So we have to ask the question about Hortense. What is, what is her motive? And Talking Horn, of course, has a motive. Guppy, what is Guppy's motive? Is Guppy... Guppy, Guppy has two motives, uh, I would suggest. One is that he says he's in love with um, Esther. He even proposes marriage early on. 
Um, uh, Guppy as a detective wants to get information about Esther's past that will benefit Esther and therefore make her fall in love with him. Um, so love is one of Guppy's motives. Um, but Guppy may have another motive as well. And as he gains more information, um, there's at least a hint that he may want to blackmail Lady Deadlock. Um, and when in that wonderful chapter where um, uh, chapter 29 that we uh, uh, referred to uh, a minute ago, um, Lady Deadlock offers to pay him for the information that he promises that he will get for her. And he declines, he doesn't accept any money from her. Uh, is this because Guppy is an honorable man or is this because Guppy has something else bigger in mind? So um, Guppy, what are Guppy's motives? So um, I'm, I'm gonna uh, call on more people. So Jennifer and then Karen and then David. Sorry, I'm always double checking to see if I'm the only Jennifer in the room. Um, yeah, Jennifer, Karen. I am not prepared to make the full blown argument that Joe is a detective, but I just wanted to <laughs> say that I was struck immediately by the parallel between Esther, who is constantly insisting that she's not clever, and Joe, who's constantly insisting that he knows nothing. And yet both of them pick up on the most minute detail of what's going on and they notice things and I'm looking at this comment by Kurt in the chat that the Court of Chancery is a non-detective because they're not interested in answering questions or getting to the bottom of anything. These are the learned men who have the competence and the status and the societal expectation that they know things. And then we have Esther and Joe who seem to me to constantly dismiss what they do know because they have constantly been dismissed. And yet, they are noticing all these important details, like the most recent one I can think of is Joe remembering the hands and where the rings were on the hands of the woman who gave him money at the cemetery. And that just makes me uh, appreciate Dickens so much. And it makes me want to pay extra attention to these two and to, if not believe everything they're saying, really take it in and think about what they're noticing because they both seem to be coming at it from this unvarnished, if not completely pure place of just being the people who are normally dismissed and whose observations are not counted or listened to or asked for. Um, and yet you have Esther with Jarndyce in the growling room, you know, and, and, and she walks away and says, can you imagine, even though I'm not reasonable, that he would be talking with me about this? And I read that just kind of from a feminist lens of she's supposed to be self-effacing because she's a woman. Of course, she's supposed to say she's not very smart. Of course, she's supposed to say she's not very reasonable, but yet she is. And so I'm just paying extra attention to both of those characters. Okay, all, all very good observations. I'm, I, I like you, I would not quite go so far as to say that Joe is a detective, um, but he certainly is a very observant um, uh, figure in the book. And he has information. I mean, he, he's, he's a source of information rather than someone who is searching for information. Um, and he has information that, uh, you know, his, his first appearance is as a witness at a trial um, where he has information that he can provide to people who are seeking information. Um, the, the information that they want is, you know, uh, about the man who, who died, uh, uh, the inquest, as a, the inkwitch, as he calls it. Uh, so, so, yes. Okay, Karen. I'm, I'm... Hi, um, I'm interested in looking at us as readers, as a detective, and um, John Mullen has written a wonderful new book called The Artful Dickens. It was reviewed in the New York Review of Books in the October 4th issue, if anybody's interested. And one of the quotes from him that just popped out at me that just roared bleak house, he says, Dickens makes us hear what is repressed. 
Dickens makes us hear what is repressed. And I think we as readers in this book are constantly trying to figure out what is being repressed? What are people not remembering? What are they trying to not face? And that's where everything is revealed. So that's my thinking. We as readers are the prime detectives. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna go on to someone else. Uh, very good observations and we can come back to this strand uh, uh, later on. So David. Unmute yourself, please. Hi, David. Hi. What Karen just said is, I think, very good. Uh, I'm focusing on Esther. And she is indeed very ambiguous about finding information going back to her childhood where her aunt said, uh, your mother is your disgrace and you are hers. Uh, she's been strongly motivated uh, not to, uh, to feel that uh, anything she learns may make matters worse. Uh, the same thing with her self-deprecation that comes from the way she was brought up as a child. And she has always this compulsion. She has the underlying belief that she can't be loved unless she does something of value for people. Uh, once she does find out a significant truth as to who her mother is, she then conspires to help keep it secret. We haven't, we, we haven't gotten to that point yet uh, in the novel. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I'll just interrupt just briefly, but don't, don't go away, that uh, one of the things that we as readers, and yes, I, I quite agree that the reader, uh, we as readers are detectives. We are trying to, uh, to, to find the secrets and solve the mystery. And, um, uh, but uh, um, what is the mystery? What is this mystery that we are reading for? Because we have figured out the family relationships. We have, if, at, at this point, uh, what are we reading for? What is the mystery? What is, what is the secret for us as, as readers? Um, we, we know uh, who Esther's parents are. Esther doesn't know who her parents are. Um, but other people are starting to find out. So, but I, I think I interrupted you, David, if you wanted to continue. Okay, I'll try and respond to what you just said. I think partly we keep reading because we just want to know what's going to happen next. <laughs> that's always the case, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and that's very much a part of a detective story as well as, well as the mystery. There's the, how is this going to play out? The ones that are pure mystery, like the, 1930s novels where everything hinges on the schedules of the railway trains are pretty dull. I'll stop there and give okay. someone else the turn. Okay. Um, Michael Stern. Are the rules are that we don't talk about the novel that we haven't? I think I'm off mute. Are the rules are that we don't talk about the novel as a whole because we, we haven't read it all yet? Yes, the rule is that we cannot talk about anything beyond chapter 32, which is the spontaneous combustion and, and where um, Esther falls ill. Um, one thing I'll throw out then for the future is what's the structure of a detective novel? And the notion of going around in circles, which other people have mentioned, is fundamental to Bleak House. If you were to map the peregrinations of Joe through London 
if you were to map, if you were to map bucket search for Esther, and again, that's in the future, um, and, and Lady Deadlock, um, people are going around in circles. And in the Freudian sense, going around in circles is about wanting to know and not wanting to know what's at the center. And is it a spiral? Do you get to the center? Or do people, do the circles never touch? Uh, Turvey drops apprentice, goes around in circles, you know, and leaves a smudge of his forehead on the wall, right? And, and that's us, right? I mean, the smudge on it. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, but in the end, um, the circle, and again, I guess, you know, where does the circle, where does the, where do the circular paths end up? And in the Freudian sense, they end up at the primal scene. And I'll let people put that in place in terms of where, where does uh, Lady Deadlock end up? Where does Nemo end up? Um, you know, uh, and, and, and it's the notion of circling around uh, the thing that cannot be said, the thing that cannot be seen. And when you go around in a circle, you see things from different angles. And that's what we do as readers. We go around and around in a circle, um, seeing the same things, seeing the same people, but always from a different angle and understanding something different. Okay. Okay, I'll, um, I'll add one small further bit to this, which is um, uh, in, our, in our first session on this novel, I spent a lot of time asking questions about Esther's doll. And I don't want us to forget the doll. Um, I, I think that the doll is part of the mystery. The doll is part of the secret that we are reading for. Um, and one of the, uh, I'm, I'm reading from the first paragraph of Esther's narration. Um, uh, now, Dolly, I am not clever, you know very well, and you must be patient with me like a deer. And so she used to sit propped up in a great armchair with her beautiful complexion and rosy lips staring at me, or not so much at me, I think, as at nothing, while I busily stitched away and told her every one of my secrets. So what are Esther's secrets? I mean, I think the, when we first read that, it, it, and it's a crucial place in the novel. This is the first paragraph of, of Esther's narration. And beginnings are always, always crucial, uh, like that wonderful first paragraph of, uh, of, the, uh, of the first chapter that introduces so many figures of speech that turn out to have uh, significance later on, like the, the reference to infection. Um, but uh, it, it, we, can, we can sort of say, ha ha, Esther's uh, 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 telling all of her secrets. She's just a little girl. What secrets could she possibly have to tell to her doll? Um, and yet Esther has secrets. Um, she may not know what the secrets are that she has. Uh, and the doll, I think, is intimately related to, um, to Esther's secrets. So, Victoria, unmute. Hi. Um, I think that it's very important for people to be within their social class in Dickens' time. And so women would expect to be limited in their behavior and how they appear to others because it was part of the upbringing that a woman was inferior. And that doesn't mean that Esther isn't a very significant part of the story, but she doesn't have the knowledge to fill in all the spaces of who she is. And it's probably safer for her to appear inferior than to jump the wrong way because of her social class, because her social class has not been defined because she doesn't know enough about her background. And other people could take it that she was pushy or inappropriate if she wasn't acting in a way that a person of her social class should act. And I love the way that the book unfolds because Every time you ask a question, you get deeper and deeper into the story and it hangs on to you because your curiosity is never finished until the end. That's um, a, a version of what Michael 
was talking about, about the circularity of, of the novel, that you keep acquiring more evidence and you go around and around and you acquire more evidence. It's Phil's squad going around with the shoulder against the, against the wall. And there's smudges and the smudges accumulate into a story. Um, so yes, um, Esther's class, very interesting question to ask about what Esther's social class is because it's indeterminate. Um, it's all she knows is that she is illegitimate, that she has no parents, um, that it would have been better if she had never been born. So, um, but in illegitimacy sort of removes her from, and, and her status as a woman, as you point out, uh, remove her from the class structure. You can't say she's working class. You can't say she's middle class. She certainly isn't a, an aristocrat. How will she acquire social class? She doesn't have a, have a full identity. She can't, she can't acquire social class until she is inserted into a place. And she is, I guess we could say, as the ward uh, of of Mr. Jarndyce, you could say she's beginning to acquire some of his status, but she's not fully of his social class either. So yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't agree. Okay. My best friend was illegitimate and was adopted, and she does not even to this day have a pass passport. She cannot, she hasn't got a birth certificate because she was illegitimate even though she was adopted she had fabulous wealthy parents and she's my age and so the the stain of not knowing where you came from or the possibility of being illegitimate would stay with her for the rest of her life and i find it unbelievable that nobody has tried to rectify the records of people of, ch of people who were born as children and who still do not have a birth certificate. In this wonderful, I, this is a response to what you're, you're saying. In this wonderful um, first paragraph of Esther's first um, uh, chapter, uh, she uh, looks at the doll uh, staring at me or not so much at me as at nothing. And I think part of Esther's secret is that she is nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's nothing in terms of social class. She's nothing in terms of self-esteem. She's nothing in terms of identity. Um, and one other, of course, link that uh, we can now make since we have figured all of this out up through chapter 32 is that she is the daughter of a man named Hodden, who passes himself off as Nemo, which means no one. So Esther is nothing, and she's the daughter of no one. Thank you. So, Glenna. Yes, um, I was gonna say, first off, that I think this discussion of who is a detective is so rich opens up a new way of looking at the novel. And the, when I, when we, my first universe, when we talked about this and I hadn't reread it in some years, I couldn't believe that one man kept all this in his mind, <laughs> this enormous plot. But now what I'm thinking is, I've known for a long time that it's a meditation on the nature of justice because of Jarndyce be Jarndyce and Ridley and so on. But now I'm realizing it's also a meditation on knowledge. What do we know? How do we know it? How do we trust what we know? Who do we find out what from? And that one plot, one great novel could be profoundly about justice, profoundly about the nature of knowledge, and um, introduce all these wonderful characters. I just, one other thing before I... Uh, Stay my finish my piece is that we talked about Mrs. Snagsby as a detective, but I think the scenes between her and her husband, where she has all these, you know, dark suspicions, they're some of the funniest scenes. Dickens, I think it's just hilarious. And so, you know, 
profound meditation, incredible humor, you know, a rich array of characters, and it's all in the imagination of one man, and it's kind of awe-inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> um, th this is a rather oblique uh, response to what you just said, Glenn, and I agree completely with, with your observations about uh, this being a, a novel about knowledge and it at the same time having moments of great comedy in it um, and at the same time being a very dark novel, uh, a, a, a very bleak novel. But uh, here, here's a passage that I came across in my rereading in preparation for today that I had never noticed before. And it's it's from the Iron Master chapter, uh, chapter 28. And that chapter begins with a discussion of the poor relations. Uh, the, all the people who live off of uh, Sir Lester's wealth. And Volumnia is, is one main example of that, the, the most prominent, but there, there are many others who, uh, uh, who hope to gain from their connection, their family connection to uh, Sir Lester. And um, um, here's uh, the passage I wanna read. From my Lord Boodle through the Duke of Foodle down to Noodle, Sir Lester, like a glorious spider, stretches his threads of relationship. Sir Lester as a great spider with threads of relationship. For a minute there, I thought, that's Dickens. Dickens as a great spider weaving this gigantic web with threads of relationship. What connection can there be? Um, you know, uh, anyway. Sir Lester as a great spider. Uh, so thank you, Glenna. Yes, Dan, Dan Stewart. Hi. Um, I was just gonna say another detective is Smallweed or Grandfather Smallweed. And he's kind of the money lender who's trying to get money from George and knows that Captain Hawden and George are connected and he tries to exploit that, but it brings to attention a lot, a lot of the social systems or structures that these amateur detectives try to use, whether it be the legal system with Tolkienhorn or the you know, financial system with um, Smallweed. And it's just a way that they can manipulate and extort uh, situations that otherwise you know, um, wouldn't be possible without you know, them being aligned with that. Um, so. Yep, no. We, we shouldn't forget that this is a great social novel. It's, a, it's an observation, uh, an exploration on the class system, on economics, on uh, uh, the legal system. Um, one of the connections is that everybody seems to be in one way or another in chancery. Um, you know, we are, we are all involved. Um, so yes, thank you, Gary. Um, Esther, as detective, um, maybe wondering who her parents are. What I love in this segment of the novel, um, and this is my second reading, I have not read this since my junior year of high school, and it's been many, many years ago. So I'm seeing so much in this now that, of course, I didn't see 100 years ago. In any event, um, what I wanted to say is that, you know, her as a detective asking maybe who she is, what I find so interesting, and there's that term character foil. Well, I think this plot foil, I'm going to use that term, and I'm going to say that here she is with Mrs. Jellybee and Caddy and all of these kids that Mrs. Jellybee has. And then, then there's Mrs. Partigal, who has her kids. And it's just this total contrast to her own life, in a way. So it's a psychological journey in a way to find out who she is. She's really concerned about all of them. And yet she hasn't found out who she is herself. And I just love that. And they, of course, as characters, they are so oblivious in a comic way and a serious way to what's going on in the world. And we could actually add um, Mr. Turvey drop to that little group too, as well as Mr. Skimpole as sort of oblivious to what's going on around them. 
But just getting back to Esther and, and who she is, she's exposed or she's around so many situations where, and she invests in that. You know, she invests in Caddy, Mrs. Jellybee, Jellybee's daughter, all of that, I think is really interesting. And, and again, as a comic in a serious way. Yes. Um, you use the term oblivious to characterize Pardigal and Jellybee. Yeah, and, I, I, and I, that was a question I was going to ask John. Yeah. I was going to say, what do you think Dickens is doing there? With uh, And I don't know if that is the correct word that I would use the word oblivious, but there's something about them not being aware of what their surroundings are. They're not in touch. It's more with than the world. It's more, it, I, would, I would say it's more than oblivion. I would say it's neglect. Yeah, uh, well, definitely. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's willed refusal to know. Uh, uh, Good and, point. So if, if this is a, a, a novel about epistemology, about, about knowledge, there, there are people who simply don't want to know that uh, there is poverty locally right. who focus their attention telescopically on poverty outside of, of England. There are people who don't want to know, who care about um, um, visiting the poor, but don't acknowledge the fact that they neglect their own children. They're, children. Uh, you know, and, uh, and, and Skimpole is the, the greatest figure in the novel of neglect. Um, Turvey Drop is another uh, neglectful parent. I, th I think for, for Esther, uh, Esther is particularly sensitive to uh, neglectful mothers. And right. one, of, one of the ways in which Esther, because she has no mother, and one of the ways in which Esther tries to form a personality is by being a mother. Being a mother. Uh, uh, and so not having a mother, she enacts motherhood as a strategy and she tries to be good in order to win some love to herself but i think that that esther that esther who goes around being good is a false self i i, I don't think that's the authentic esther and one of the ways that i try to track that is by focusing on what i what i call narrative voice because there there's a voice that characterizes esther from early on which is a simpering voice it's oh i'm not clever you know and when i when i read this i can i can sort of mock it and ha ham it up and you know i did you did you know it's it, it's and i i hear that that voice as an inauthentic voice but there are other places where esther's voice is very powerful it's, it's, it, it modulates, it modulates, in, and in some ways it becomes the equal of, uh, in its range of, of tonalities and emphasis and power of description uh, to the voice of the other narrator. Um, and it's easy to- Well, say certainly with, when she's speaking to Richard, for example, she's speaking to him about his future and so forth. She's very, in many ways, assertive about a lot of that. So, well, you know, it, it's well, it, well said, it, John, you know, yes. yeah. It's, it's, it's both a greater assertiveness, but it's also a, a greater inner power of, of, uh, uh, of expression that, uh, and, and it's one way to think about that. And I, I don't think this is, necessarily the best way to think about it is that, oh, this is where Dickens shows through. When Esther writes a powerful description of, of Chesney Lowell or something, oh, that's, that's, that's where Dickens is, uh, is uh, showing through. It's Dickens not doing the female impersonation as well as he had done it elsewhere. But I think that's the wrong way to go about thinking about this uh, shift in, in Esther's voice. I think that Esther is a very powerful uh, voice and potentially a very powerful person if she can access her own inner strength. But for multiple reasons, the fact that she's illegitimate, the fact that she's a woman, the, fa the fact that, that she has 
no one really to, to, uh, to give her a place in the world, uh, doesn't always have access to that strength, that, that inner strength. And so one of the things that we as readers should try to do is to track the times and places where Esther speaks in a powerful voice. What are the occasions? And I would suggest that the topic of motherhood uh, is a place where Esther um, uh, becomes stronger and gets access to her unconscious life, uh, to inner strengths, inner inner resources in, in ways that uh, uh, don't always manifest when she's being good Esther. Good, good Esther for me is a kind of false self personality. And there's a deeper, darker, richer Esther who will appear from time to time. So Brad, I'm going to keep going on. So thank you, Gary. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Great to be here again. Um, I had a question. I, I, I have not had a lot of experience in Victorian literature. Um, I read a lot, but I, I haven't read a lot of that. And I, I wondered vis-a-vis -vis the detective story question. Uh, I just had a couple of thoughts and ruminations and sure. wanted to throw it back to you, John, and others. If, 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 the, if the detective story is a metaphorical version of searching for the truth about life. It's, it's it, I mean, it's not far from Gemma's idea in that, is this really just about how hard it is to find out what's true about the world? Um, and the, as, as you pointed out, John, the detective story is the circular version of how we try to figure out what's true and, and what's right. And, that we actually have a fear of finding out what's true. <laughs> we, we, we kind of think we want to know what's true if it helps us. And we don't really want to know what's true if it's not really what we believe or what we want to know. And, and that that feels metaphorical of all of life, really. And, and that this is a, a wonderful veneer of exploring that notion. Um, my second, my second, and conjoined idea is that the Victorian period is a time before psychology. It's a time before we really begin to understand. I mean, imagine knowing the world without knowing anything about psychology. I mean, it's like, you know, once that truth is part of our world and our conversation, I don't know that we can undo that. But, but if, if that's the world that this comes from and the conversations you've had about identity, is identity all about context? Is it all about class? Is it all about money? Is it all about the context of our world rather than the morality of our choices? And, and again, I believe that is part of the core of this dilemma or part of the core of this conflict that the good people aren't necessarily the ones that are honored. They're honored for their context in the world, for their place in the world, not even their ideas or their, their wisdom as, as some people have mentioned before. So um, I wondered, and then to finish that off is John's point about, about, about agency, about personal agency and where we get our strength from. Is it from our context and where we belong in the world or is it from our morality and what we believe is good and true and how we can live by that truth rather than the context that is shaped around us. And I know that's a lot of wordiness, but I, <laughs> I, I wonder about those things. Those, those are very good things to wonder about. Um, so thank you, Brad, for, for suggesting them. I, I, would, I would take issue with only one part of your wonderful questions, and it's the, the premise that uh, the Victorian age was um, not an age of psychology, because uh, Freud was a Victorian. I mean, if we start with that, that simple fact. And the patients whom he analyzed were people who grew up in the Victorian period. Admittedly, they were not uh, in English Victorian 
period, but we can extrapolate from European bourgeoisie. So I think, I think that the 19th century is an age of the beginnings of psychology. And just to go biographically into Dickens, Dickens was very interested in um, the phenomenon of mesmerism. Um, and mesmerism was one of the early antecedents of what we now think of as psychoanalysis or um, that there were somatic, people, people had somatic issues. Um, uh, and and uh, they could, Dickens actually learned how to put people into mesmeric trances and offered suggestions to them. And so Dickens is exploring intuitively without having a, a system of, uh, of psychological understanding that uh, we would recognize as modern. I think Dickens is exploring a world that we would call the world of depth psychology. Um, and often the depth psychology in Dickens manifests itself on the surface, that, that his characters are, um, are characters who are eccentrics. Uh, they, they, they seem to be obsessed with a particular uh, notion or something, and they, that often produces comedy. But I think beneath that surface, there is a way in which Dickens is exploring how uh, people somatize, that is how they, they translate into their bodily activity, unconscious conflicts that are part of their depth psychology. So um, uh, anyway, don't, don't sell Dickens short in terms oh, I, of- I did really, I just thought- Psychological we're, understanding. We're more, we're more interested and these worlds seem to be contextual, all context, identity seem to come all from context. Um, rather than morality. I don't know. Well, there certainly are issues of morality. I mean, we, should, we could think about who- I mean, that, that would be the dilemma though, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, the dilemma, yeah. Um, but these, these, are, these are excellent questions. So um, I'm, I'm moving on. Thank you, thank you for that though. Phil, Phyllis and then David and then Nina. Um, hi, back to the um, detective, but also a little bit more of Dickens's uh, particular interest. As we've noted before, he's very interested in, in parentage and, and who your fathers and the relations of parents to children. And one just little example of how this plays out in Bleak House is when Esther starts to encounter the mother of um, Mr. Woodcourt, and I won't say anything more about him um, and her, but that Mrs. Woodcourt twice Esther notes likes to boast about her famous Welsh ancestry and the pedigree and um and and you know, a boastful mother I mean he's you know she she wants to make sure he keeps it up right and and here is Esther as we've said as as parentless stationless and so she Mrs. Woodcourt can almost unload to Esther because Esther is kind of a neutral listener at least as far as she knows and at, this is where one of Esther's narrative um, voices, I think, shows itself to be much more than the Dolly voice, which is um, she, the Welsh mother predicts that um, Esther will one day marry a rich man, much older. And the narrative says, at one time, I thought she was a storyteller. And at another, I thought she was the pink of truth. And I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, but I did, that was one of those things in this particular uh, tranche of chapters that you start to hear more and more of Esther um, observing, synthesizing, and actually offering some kind of a opinion um, in all this. But I do love the, the parents and sons. I mean, you go, go on, uh, George is the one who uh, failed his mother, you know, and, and then Phil, his helper that goes around the, um, shooting gallery, you know, with his shoulder to the wall, uh, says, oh, he just went off with a tinker when he was eight. He has no idea where he's from. And so this whole idea that you can just kind of get lost and be no one is, is I think, attention in all this. Mrs. Woodcourt is, of course, um, emphasizing genealogy and family history in order to make Esther aware that she has no family. Um, because Mrs. Woodcourt uh, 
would not like it if um, uh, anything were to, to develop between Esther and her son. Um, and Esther feels uncomfortable during that conversation without exactly knowing why. Um, and I think that's, that's perhaps an example uh, of, of, among many of Esther's not wanting to know something um, that she seems aware of. She's aware of being uncomfortable, but doesn't quite know why. So um, I'm going to jump over David and Nina and go to uh, Kathleen, uh, whom I know as Trudy, because she has not spoken yet. And I'll come back to David and Nina. Yes. Trudy, unmute. This isn't really directly relevant. Uh, and it's also sort of looking back and looking ahead. But I think that some of these comments and particularly the comment that we the readers are detectives um, gets at the genius of Dickens. Because I, I, for me, what happens with Dickens is that we ourselves, are um, oh, how can I say it with the characters? So when uh, I I did a piece for you know Dickens on the Go or whatever it was, but I never sent it in. But it was the same motivated by the same sentence that motivated Gerhart, and that is whether or not I will turn out to be the hero of my life, right? And David Copperfield. And we're coming upon David Copperfield. And my point with David Copperfield what is that just as we've been able to list many, many detectives in this novel, you can, you can list many, many heroes in David Copperfield. So Dickens, I, I can't put my, he has, the genius of um, show of seeing in his characters and therefore in a way letting us feel that we are all detectives and we are all heroes. Okay. David Copperfield. So it's not very relevant. Uh, a quote from him, and I think it's from our mutual friend. No one is useful in this world who lightens the burden um, of it for anyone else. And I think that's what his, what is true of the detectives here. The, you know, heroes, the children, right, in his books again and again, and what he wants us to be. So he wants us to be detectives in this. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Um, and David yes. Copperfield was, of course, the, the novel immediately before um, yeah. Bleak House. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, David Copperfield and Bleak House have in common is their use of first person narration. And um, uh, I think that uh, in both of those novels, we have to think a little bit more deeply about first person narration. I guess the point, yeah. First person narration in Esther's case as in David, but I don't, I don't want to talk about David now, um, is retrospective. And it so, invites us in also. It invites us in, but it is mm -hmm. after the fact. Right. And in this, in this novel, uh, we have two narrators, one of whom writes in the present tense always, and the other writes mostly in the past tense, but sometimes in the present tense. And when Esther writes in the present tense, uh, I have a great deal of difficulty in beginning to write my portion of these pages 
that's a sentence in the in the present tense and it calls attention to esther as a writer and it calls attention to the fact that esther is writing this from a perspective after the events have taken place so when we talk about esther as narrator and when we talk about esther's narrative voice we need to think and it's difficult to do but we need to think about an esther who is writing this um, narrative whom we have not yet arrived at yeah. in the story of the novel um, and That's that it. later esther knows everything that has happened she's perhaps not quite yet a detective mm -hmm. uh, no that, that's not what i want to say mm -hmm. she's not a detective in the same way that guppy is or that talking horn is who are trying to find out what happened mm -hmm. the esther who writes this retrospectively is trying to figure out what things mean not what happened she knows what happened um, she knows everything that has happened she knows who her parents are but she doesn't know what that means for her now mm -hmm. so esther's role as detective is operates on a different level from the detection that the other characters are involved in Esther as narrator is reliving, re-experiencing all of the events of her life and trying to figure out in the present what they mean for her. So she's the retrospective narrator. She's said. the retrospective de detective. And it's, it's, it's a kind of meta detective yeah. novel. It's, it's, it's a for, for Esther as narrator, it's no longer events that signify, it's the meaning of those events for her in the present. And we won't be able, I mean, we, what, what it means for me is that um, I pay very close attention to the points where Esther talks about her activity of writing and I think it was Victoria who early in, in, our, in today's discussion talked about Esther as a writer. And um, those are the places where Esther is trying to, to put together not the facts of her life, but their meaning for her now in the present. And it's as if by reliving and retelling the events of her life. She can put them into a better order, a more meaningful, uh, more significant order. Great, thank but you. That I think may get at some of the questions that Brad was talking about, yeah. um, about the, the, the meaning of, of, of life. So um, I'm gonna call on David and Nina. Um, and then I have a, there's a, 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 there are two scenes in the novel that I wanna look at. So David, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I hope I can make sense here. I've got a tangle of ideas, one of which is the question you originally asked, one of which is Mrs. Jellybee and Mrs. Pardiddle. And I want to come at it by way of C.S. Lewis, who talks in critical writing about all creations, all literary crea creations as being secondary worlds, simpler and less complex than the world God has created. So this particular secondary world has a number of rules and a number of fascinations. And, uh, I think the, one of the fascinations is how people are connected 
it used to be the case that uh, people who didn't like Dickens said, oh, those coincidences, how can you put up with that? Well, the coincidences are because one of the rules of Dickens' created world is that everybody and everything is connected. That he wants the reader to realize that Esther's illness, which she catches from Joe, is- From Charlie, who caught it from Joe. Yeah, okay. But that class differences and financial differences don't make a difference. You still come in contact with people. Diseases still spread, as we've been noticing. Uh, Mrs. Jellyby and Mrs. Pardiggle are both people who Dickens is making prominent because they are ignoring what is in front of their own eyes, not just their own children, but street children like Joe. Dickens hates to see neglected or abused children. The other place I'm going to go is loosely connected, but there's a good essay by W.H. Auden on detective stories called The Guilty Vicarage. And he says that what a detective story is about is the disruption of order by a murder and ultimately the restoration of order. And I think the Dickens novel comes out with a rest restored order. I don't know if what I've said holds together, but I'll pass it to Nina. We, we of course, won't know until we get there whether there is a restoration of order. And um, um, so we'll, we'll stay tuned about, about that. But um, thank you. Nina. Uh, yeah, sorry. So um, I just wanted to make a comment because a lot of other people were like making comments earlier. I can't remember exactly who, um, but just talking about how like not knowing your background and like whether you want to know about your your background um, and how that informs how you act. So um, would you say like Mr. George is kind of actually like the opposite of Esther in terms of like he knows where he's from, but he um, like actually is trying to like willfully forget it. And, and does that give him more agency to kind of like act however he feels like if he doesn't feel like he's um, part of a particular, like he has some, like that he's part of a particular class that he needs to hold up some sort of, you know, reputational standard or anything like that. Um, is, is his story a little bit like a, like I think someone said like plot foil or whatever to kind of like how Esther is going about her life? I was just curious. Yeah, um, interesting. And um, I, I hadn't thought of locating George in that particular way, but George is someone who knows where he comes from and uh, is trying, if to forget it is, is maybe not quite the, the right way, but to, to sever his relationship with where he comes from. Um, um, I'm not sure if it's possible to forget, but yeah, sure. Um, sorry. Yeah. I, maybe that's like a strong word, no, no, but basically he's doing the opposite, right? He's trying to like distance himself because um, yeah. he doesn't want to like know or have the association or remember or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and th this is a, a, a loose thread, but I think it may be relevant. When Esther buries her doll, one way to understand that action is that she's burying a certain past because she's starting on a new life. She's, she's had the news that she's going to be um, adopted essentially by, by Mr. Jarndyce and the doll is associated with the past that she wants to forget. But Esther can't forget her past. She dreams about that doll 
you know, she may have buried it, but uh, it keeps coming back in her mind and it's part of her unconscious. And similarly, I think George, he may try to sever his connection with where he comes from, but that connection is going to return. It, it, you can't keep the past out of your present life. Um, so um, I want to, I want to, I'm going to jump because there are two things, I, two passages in the novel that I want to spend some time looking at that we have not talked about. And one of them is in the magnificent chapter entitled Lady Deadlock. And uh, there are two scenes in, in that chapter where Esther confronts Lady Deadlock for the, for the first time. The first instance is in church. And there's, there's an illustration that goes with that uh, scene in, in the church. And um, when Esther sees Lady Deadlock, and, and we, we know that what she's seeing is a face that she recognizes, but that she can't or doesn't want to recognize. It's again, that question of knowing and not knowing and not wanting to know, but being curious at the same time. And here's, here's the way that Esther describes that in retrospect. Shall I ever forget the rapid beating in my heart occasioned by the look I met as I stood up? Shall I ever forget the manner in which those handsome, proud eyes seemed to spring out of their languor and to hold mine? It was only a moment before I cast mine down, released again, if I may say so, on my book. But I knew the beautiful face quite well in that short space of time. And notice the way that she looks down at her book. She wants to release herself from that recognition. It's a recognition, but a turning away from, from the recognition. Um, and very strangely, there was something quickened in me associated with the lonely days at my godmother's. Yes, away even to the days when I had stood on tiptoe to dress myself at my little glass after dressing my doll. So here's the doll again. And then, and, and this, although I had never seen this lady's face before in all my life, I was quite sure of it, absolutely certain. And when she says, I was quite sure of it, she's trying to reassure herself that she hasn't seen that face before. And of course, we can put this together. The face is one of the prominent locations. It's the, the face is, it, you, could, you could almost say the face is the secret um, of, the, of the novel. Um, and she recognizes both the godmother's face because the godmother is in fact her aunt. And then beyond that, she's recognizing the mother whom she never saw. But is it really true that she never saw her mother before? Um, that's a, a question I'd like to leave open. But then, so this, this is the first scene and it's a mirror scene. Esther is looking at Lady Dedlock and seeing her own face in the mirror and remembering the scene where she with her doll would dress herself before the mirror. So this, this is a novel full of mirrors. It, it's, it's as if that face, um, the, the face that Esther is carrying on her body is reflected in not every female, but many, many females whom she encounters in the novel. Ada is a mirror figure. Ada is a doll, I would suggest. Um, Rosa, the, the, uh, the, the serving girl in, in Lady Dedlock's service, is another mirror image of, of Esther. Um, Hortense is a mirror image. Uh, Hortense, who changes clothes with Lady Dedlock. And, you know, and, es and Joe says famously in that scene when uh, Talking Horn and Snagsby uh, bring uh, Hortense in disguise. Is there three of them? Um, uh, 
you know, and we could say, are there four of them? Are there five of them? Uh, how, how many of them are there? The multiple personalities, the multiple faces of, of Esther. But the passage that I want to look at is later in that same chapter. And it's uh, the second encounter with, with Lady Dedlock. And there's a, there's a rainstorm. And Ada and Esther take refuge with Mr. Jarndyce inside a keeper's lodge. And it's toward the end of, of, of that chapter. Um, and uh, the Keeper's Lodge. The Keeper's Lodge is an important location. We've met that Keeper's Lodge before. If you go back to chapter three, no, chapter two, excuse me, um, in fashion, um, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, this is the, uh, second page of chapter two, my lady Dedlock, who is childless, looking out at the early twilight from her boudoir at a keeper's lodge and seeing the light upon the uh, light of a fire upon the latticed panes and smoke rising from the chimney and a child chased by a woman running out into the rain to meet the shining figure of a wrapped up man coming through the gate has been put quite out of temper. My Lady Dedlock says she has been bored to death. That's as early as chapter two, that's the Keeper's Lodge. And My Lady Dedlock, who is childless, says the narrator, voicing there the general opinion of the world because the Lady Dedlock who is known to the world has no children. But it's there, the, the plot, a child chased by, uh, uh, by a woman, that's, that's one form of detection, is chasing the child, finding the child. Um, coming out in the rain to meet the shining figure of a wrapped up man coming through the gate. That wrapped up man is the father in, in, this, in this image, the wrapped up man lying in the graveyard, coming through the gate, the gate that closes the the, uh, um, the graveyard. It's all there uh, it, brilliantly by, by Dickens in, um, in that, that second chapter. The whole plot, you could say, is there in that second chapter. But back to the chapter entitled Lady Dedlock and Esther's second encounter with, um, with Lady Dedlock. She's seen her at the church. She's had this feeling of recognition that she can't quite locate, she can't quite explain, she can't quite place. And then a second encounter um, in the Keeper's Lodge. Um, is it not dangerous to sit in so, ex in so exposed a place? Oh no, Esther dear, said Ada quietly. Ada said it to me, but I had not spoken. So there's a resemblance, not only between the face, but also the voice. Lady Dedlock speaks and says, is it not dangerous to be in such, in so exposed a place, to sit in so exposed a place? I'm having trouble with my light here. Um, That sentence, is it not dangerous to sit in so exposed a place, is a crucial sentence in the novel. At a surface level, what it indicates is that there's a rainstorm and Esther and Ada are sitting at the door of the keeper's lodge, exposed to the weather. Is it not dangerous to sit so close to the storm? So it expresses Lady Dedlock's concern for the welfare, the well-being, the safety of these two young girls. 
But here's another way in which that sentence is operating in the novel. And it turns on the two key words in that sentence, dangerous and exposed. So Lady Dedlock could be saying, is it not dangerous to me for you, Esther, to sit in such an exposed place? Because Lady Dedlock by this time has recognized Esther as the legitimate daughter. She knows, or at least part of it knows or fears that exposure to the world of her illegitimate daughter would be dangerous to her social situation, her status in the world as my Lady Dedlock. So who, who said that? Which meaning is, is present there? Both meanings are, are present. But if we pursue this scene toward the end, I'm skipping over um, some, uh, some passages. Um, and um, uh, Lady Dedlock does not speak again to Esther. She engages Mr. Jarndyce in conversation. And uh, she says, uh, I'm, I'm picking up in it. I presume this is your other ward, Miss Clare. He presented Ada in form, Jarndyce. You will, uh, you will lose the disinterested part of your Don Quixote character, said Lady Dedlock to Mr. Jarndyce over her shoulder again if you only redress the wrongs of beauty like this, but present me, and she turned full upon me, to this young lady too. So she's asking for an introduction to Esther, whom she already knows is her daughter. Miss Summerson really is my ward, said Mr. Jarndyce. I am responsible to the Lord Chancellor in her case. Has Miss Summerson lost both her parents, said my lady? Yes. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop over one little detail there. Um, Esther, as narrator, is writing this scene in retrospect. When she says, when she quotes Lady Dedlock, has Miss Summerson lost both her parents, said my lady, that my lady is Esther in retrospect referring to Lady Dedlock. But to say my lady is a way of saying my mother. So Esther in retrospect knows what is happening here. Yes is the answer. And then uh, it goes on. And then uh, Lady Dedlock sends for her servants, her servant. Um, and uh, what happens is that Hortense shows up along with Rosa and uh, she sends for her maid. What now said Lady Dedlock, two, that is two servants have showed up. I am your maid, my lady at the present, said the French woman. The message was for the attendant. I was afraid you might mean me, my lady, said the pretty girl. That's Rosa. I did mean you, child, replied her mistress calmly. Put that shawl on me. Notice how Lady Dedlock refers to Rosa as child. There. Esther, as narrator, is narrating this scene. So what is Esther, as narrator, feeling as she tells this story? She slightly stooped her shoulders to receive it, and the pretty girl lightly dropped it in its place. The French woman stood unnoticed, looking on with her lips tightly set. I am sorry, said, my, said Lady Dedlock to Mr. Jarndyce, that we are not likely to renew our former acquaintance. You will allow me to send the carriage back for your two wards. It shall be here directly. Notice how Lady Dedlock in speaking to Jarndyce says, we are not likely to renew our acquaintance. In other words, 
I will not see you again, and therefore I will not run the risk of letting other people notice the resemblance between Esther and myself. So she's trying to protect herself from the danger of exposure, Lady Dedlock is. Uh, but as she would on no account accept this offer, she took a graceful leave of Ada, none of me, and put her hand upon his proffered arm and got into the carriage, which was a little low park carriage with a hood. Notice how Lady Dedlock says goodbye to Ada, but not to Esther. What is Esther feeling as narrator as she tells this, as she writes this story? Not Ada the character, not Esther the character, but Esther the narrator. She's noticing very acutely everything that Lady Dedlock says and does. Um, Come in, child, she said to the pretty girl. I shall want you. Go on. Again, Lady Dedlock refers to Rosa as child. Esther as character doesn't speak, but Esther as narrator is telling this whole story. What is she feeling when she tells the story of how Lady Dedlock refers to Rosa as child or says goodbye to Ada, but doesn't say goodbye to Esther? The carriage rolled away. The French woman with the wrapper she had brought hanging over her arm remained standing where she had alighted. I suppose there is nothing pride can so little bear with as pride itself, and that she was punished for her imperious manner. I'm going to skip over that wonderful sentence and come back to it at a later point. Um, uh, da, 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 da. What does Hortense do? Hortense takes off her shoes and walks back to the house through the grass. Uh, why should she walk shoeless through all that water, said my guardian. Why indeed, sir, unless it's to cool her down, said the man. Or unless she fancies it's blood, said the woman. She'd as soon walk through that as anything else, I, say, I think, when her own's up. She passed, we passed not far from the house a few minutes afterwards, peaceful as it had looked when we first saw it. It looked more so now with a diamond spray glittering all about it, a light wind blowing, the birds no longer hushed but singing strongly, everything refreshed by the late rain and the little carriage shining in the doorway like a fairy carriage made of silver. Still, very steadfastly and quietly walking toward it, a peaceful figure too in the landscape went Mademoiselle Hortense, shoeless through the wet grass. End of chapter. It's a marvelous, marvelous scene that needs to be read at two levels. Esther, the character in the scene, Esther, the retrospective narrator telling this. And this is a place where I think Esther's voice is particularly strong. That last sentence that I, that I just read, let me read it again because it's so elegant. Still, very steadfastly and quietly walking toward it, a peaceful figure, too, in the landscape, went Mademoiselle Hortense, shoeless through the wet grass. Just the syntax of that is elegant, the inversion of subject and verb, the complicated syntax, um, the, the language that precedes this is, I think, a powerful voice. And it's the voice of Esther, the retrospective narrator, in a scene where she, the narrator, is feeling very powerful emotions because she has just narrated a scene in which Lady Dedlock has refused to acknowledge her. This is a point where I think Dickens's understanding of psychology is brilliant. And what is unsaid, what is unspoken here is part of the brilliance. 
So we're out of time. I'm gonna have to stop. Thank you so much for your contributions. There's more that I wanted to get to that we never reached, but we have another meeting in November. So I'll see you then. Thanks and bye-bye for now. <laughs>